All right. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. We're glad you're joining us. And welcome to the Polar Bears International Spring Tundra Connections broadcast, our Hangout on Air. Our partners on today's Hangout are Google Maps and the Google Plus Connected Classrooms. And we want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy school day to join us today through Google Plus or on our Polar Bear TV. So today we're going to explore the polar bear capital of the world. And the polar bear capital of the world is in church. Chill, Manitoba, which is on the shores of the Hudson Bay. You'll have to get your maps out and look at it. Up in Canada, in the subarctic. And this is where polar bear migration takes place. The, the polar bears migrate through here and wait for the Hudson Bay to freeze every year and go out on the ice. And we were so lucky this year because we had Google with us and they were capturing Google Street View. So we're going to look at that with a Google Street View. Our program today will last about 30 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. And as a reminder, you can submit questions in the chat window and we'll try our best to answer your questions. So we're excited to share with you the adventure that Google Maps took up to the polar bear capital of the world last fall, Churchill, Manitoba. And Google Maps collected Street View imagery in some really crazy ways. What do you hear all the things that, that Google did? Uh, and that's why one of our participants on the panel is here today to tell you how we collected that imagery. So now you can sit at your house, in your school, wherever, on your own computer, your mobile device, your phone, and you can explore the subarctic and the tundra yourself. So we're going to do some quick introductions here. I'm really excited that we have some schools joining us today, and they were schools that participated with us when we were up on the, the tundra this fall and the Tundra Connections webcast that we had. I'm Julene Reed. I'm the director of the Tundra Connections, and so we're with Polar Bears International. But we also have two schools who are going to introduce themselves. They're from Grandview Heights School in Edmonton in Canada. So let's let um, Miss Lona's class introduce themselves first. Woo! Hi, we are we are the Grade 5 class from Grandview Heights School, and we're very interested in the Canadian North and in polar bears. Yay, we're so glad you're here. And our other classroom. Hi, we're the uh, grade four class, Grandview Heights. Happy to be here as well. Well, we're very glad you're here too. And so now we'll let the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Karen. Hi, everybody. My name is Karen, and I work on the Google Maps team, and I led the project that took up the uh, Street View camera up to the polar bear capital of the world to work with Polar Bears International. So happy to be here. Hello. And Alyssa? Hi, everybody. I'm Alyssa. Uh, I work at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, where I study polar bears, and I just completed my master's degree on the Western Hudson Bay polar bears that we're looking at today, so I'm very happy to be here as well. So we have some great panelists. You can learn more about polar bears, more about the technology. And I'm going to show you where Churchill is now. Uh, there's a little map that you're going to see, and you'll be able to, v to view where the, the Hudson Bay is and where Churchill is, and you've kind of seen that before. But we also want to, to just go into sort of what's going on, what we did up there when we were in the tundra, how we captured the street view, what equipment we used, and so I'm going to let Karen from Google tell us all about that. Karen, will you share with us what this trucker is that you're talking about? What is a trucker and all that stuff? Yeah, so um, a lot of you guys may have seen street view cars on the city streets around where you live or in the major cities, and that's how we collect this street level imagery called street view uh, on Google Maps. But more and more places um, that you may want to get to are hard to get to with the cars. And so Google invented this backpack. So now that camera that's on top of the cars is actually on a backpack. But it's not just for use on a backpack. So here you'll see in that picture, you see BJ um, from Polar Bears International wearing the trekker, the Street View trekker, as a backpack and walking around um, the this, this little bit of the streets of Churchill uh, while we were up there in October. But we decided that it wasn't, doesn't need to be just a backpack. We can also take that backpack and mount it on top of the tundra buggy that Polar Bears International takes out to the snow. 
I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. Well, uh, you classrooms that, that, that are joining, you guys actually came and had a tour of the Tundra Buggy 1 in October. Do you remember that? And we, sh we actually took you on the roof to show you the Street View Trucker. And so this is what it looks like. It was just mounted on this, the, the Tundra Buggy, and then it, BJ drove it around the Tundra, and it's taking pictures the whole time. And so that's what allows us to capture and create the Street View imagery. And so you can see here that everything that you might see when you're inside the Tundra Buggy, the camera also captured. And so that's what we're going to look at in a little bit with Street View. Um, but this isn't the first time we've done something crazy like this. We definitely think that it's always fun to experiment and try new things. And so in the past, we've actually put the trekker on um, a dog sled. We've also show, yeah, there's a picture of it there. We've put it on a dog sled up in up in Iqaluit in Nunavut. We've also um, even put it on a boat, if you can believe that. Yeah, there's a picture of it on the boat in the Galapagos Islands. And so we tried just crazy experiments like this um, to, to really capture imagery in amazing places like Churchill. When we were in Churchill, we also collected not just the tundra with a tundra buggy, but we also put it on the back of a pickup truck. There's the picture. Yeah, there's the picture of the pickup truck. And we mounted it on the back of the pickup truck and drove around the streets of Churchill and captured all the streets of Churchill on Street View. So not only can you explore the tundra, the Arctic tundra, and the polar bears, but you can also see the polar bear capital of the world, Churchill itself, and see what is it like if you're in fourth or fifth grade up in Churchill, what's your life like? And so it's really fun to imagine and, and walk around the streets and try to pretend that. So, um, so yeah. So I think <clears throat> the best thing to do now would be to go and look at the Street View imagery. Do you guys want to do that? All right, let's try. So I'm going to come back here to my screen and um, I have a Google map here. Um, at, I just basically typed in google.com slash maps. And when I'm going to Churchill, you can see that um, here's the, the Cape Churchill. At the bottom right-hand corner, you can actually see a little peg man, a little uh, yellow peg man. And if I zoom in here, you can see that I'm, I can actually click and drag this little peg man. Oh, here he goes. He's dragging. He's flying through the air. And I'm going to drop him right down, right on Churchill over here. There we go. And that just drops me right down into the Street View imagery, and I can start exploring and looking around. So in that case, I dropped right down on the main um, road that connects, that connects the airport and the tundra with the town of Churchill. So I can click and zoom around. Pretty amazing. But there are a lot of other cool places. And I, I thought what would be might be fun is if I each of us show you our favorite panoramas, our favorite um, images from the Street View Collect. So I have a couple here that are already ready to show you. This is a Street View image from the Tundra. And you can see as I scroll around, I can look up, I can look down, I can look all around, but you know there's something special about this one. If I zoom in here, what do you guys see? <gasps> I see a polar bear sleeping. He sleeps in the willows. He's sleeping there. He's waiting for the ice to freeze so that he can go out and find some food. And so this is this is basically what we were looking for when we were out there on the tundra. We were looking for little bits of off-white beige colored animals. Like, a pol this, like this polar bear here, sleeping or walking in the, in the snow. I have another favorite pano. This one here is an amazing, amazing scene. So we're really lucky that we captured this in Street View. If I zoom in here with my zoom bar, I can see, what, oops, sorry, what do I see there? I see two little polar bears. Actually, they're pretty big polar bears. Two big polar bears sparring. They're fighting, but they're not really fighting. Elisa tells me that they're actually play fighting. This is something that they do in practice. They're practicing fighting. They're sizing each other up. So in a little bit, they'll stop and they'll rest. But they're basically 
biding their time waiting for the ice to freeze. And so this is one of my favorite panos. Karen, what are those structures, those kind of vehicles behind and around you there? Yeah, that's a great question. So the vehicles in the back there, we'll get to in a moment, in a little while hopefully if we have time, but that's the Tundra Buggy Lodge and that's where the scientists and people who visit the Tundra, that's where they sleep, that's where they stay, that's where they eat, that's where they, um, they sleep when they come out to the Tundra. It's really cozy, it's really comfortable, but it's basically a little hotel out in the middle of the Tundra, if you can believe it. So um, hopefully we'll have some time to actually go inside and look at what the bunks look like so we can imagine ourselves out there um, as scientists, polar bear scientists, just like Elisa. So um, my last favorite pano is this one here. Now this is, looks if you look at it really quickly, you might think it's just a road, but it's actually the road that goes into the town of Churchill. And this is my favorite part about it. Do you guys see this right here? This is a polar bear warning sign, a polar bear crossing. Now I live in California and I see deer crossing signs all the time. Right? I, I'm always looking out for deer because I don't want to hit them when I'm driving. I, I drive very slowly, make sure that I, I can look for them. And in this town of Churchill, they actually have to look for polar bears. So this is one of my favorite panos because it really makes me think, what is it like to live there? How is it different from where I live? So I, I really love this pano. Well, that's it for my panos. Maybe I'll um, uh, bring it over to Elisa to sh uh, or Julene. Julene, why don't you go first? Share your favorite pano. Okay, and and I love the panos that you chose. And and I will tell the the students that when we're out in the tundra buggies and on the tundra, it reminds you of looking out at the beach because you can see for miles and miles, and it's all white like sand, except the sand is snow. So I think it's really interesting how it's different from where you live and be thinking about what does this look like versus where I live. So mine is kind of a funny one. Who's ever done a photo bomb? Raise your hand if you've ever done a photo bomb. That's when somebody takes a picture and you sneak behind and you do something silly like that. Um, so in these photo bombs, sometimes on the Street View cameras, when they're going around the different parts of different cities around the world, people will photobomb them. And it's always interesting to see what people have in their yards or what's on the street. So this is the Seaport Village. It's one of the restaurants that we sometimes visit when we're in Churchill. And some of the people knew we were coming, two of the, the gentlemen knew we were coming. So if we go in really closely, you'll see on the porch, we have like a tiger hanging from a bar and a shark below it. So it's either a cheetah or a tiger. I think it's a tiger. Uh, and the shark below it. There are actually two of the employees of the Seaport Village who dressed up just for the street view so they could photobomb it. So I wanted to share that one with you because I think it's pretty funny. And Alyssa, really I think funny. you have some other street view images that you were, were your favorites as well. I do. I love that Google Maps went up there and did that. I actually lived in Churchill for a year and lots of my friends and family couldn't come visit me and it's a really hard place to explain if you don't have these photos because it's so special and now they can go look. Uh, but one of my very favorite images is um, the bear out at Cape Churchill. So this was taken uh, in late fall right when the sea ice was starting to freeze up and this is such an important time for polar bears. This bear has been on land waiting and not eating and just sleeping for at least four months and finally the day has come where the ice has come in and he can get out on it and he knows that now for the next eight or so months he can hunt and be eating and acting like a polar bear wants to act so I can only imagine that he's feeling pretty good in this picture and that's why I like it so much. I'm sure. Karen did you have any others you want to show? Um, well maybe um, it might be a good time to show there's a lot of different places that you guys can go to find um, to find your own favorite panos um, and the best place to start is google.com slash street view and maybe once we when we get a little further on Julie I can show some of the indoor imagery that sounds great great well so why is the Hudson Bay so special why is this western Hudson Bay area so special that tourists come from all over the world every year to this really small community to see the polar bears and the best person to answer that is Alyssa so Alyssa will you fill us in on all of the details sure so these western Hudson Bay polar bears really are some of the most famous polar bears in the entire world uh, the way that Hudson Bay freezes up 
Um, it freezes up first out of the entire bay. The first ice starts forming right around Churchill, and that's why polar bears are in such close proximity to people compared to the rest of the polar bears in the world. And this has really let tourists and scientists get so close to these animals that otherwise are very hard to access in most parts of the world. And because these polar bears are so close and relatively easy to get to, we've been able to learn so, so much from them. And so many of the facts and so much of the knowledge that we have about polar bears actually comes from this particular population, which is really amazing. So one of the things that we've been able to do in this population is radio collar these bears. We've been radio collaring them since the early 1990s, so that's over 20 years. And with this data, we've been able to sit back in our offices all winter and look at our computer screens and track the bears across the bay and the Arctic, uh, which otherwise would have been just completely impossible. And PBI has uh, partnered with us, and they have a bear tracker. So you can go online, and you can look at where some of the bears in Hudson Bay are right now. We update it as often as we can. Uh, the technology isn't completely perfect, you know, polar bears are pretty tough on our little radio collars, but we have some amazing data, and I think one of the coolest things is looking at how no two bears act the same way. They all do different things. It's really hard to generalize uh, what the entire population will be doing because we really don't know. There's bears that have been collared for two or three years, and every year they do something different. And it's very neat to watch that um, on your screen and from home to see, well, where are the bears? Are, where, where are they this week? And I think that's so cool. Um, it's really, really neat to be able to do this. Uh, one, one of the things that this data has shown us, uh, so we have the collar data, we have the physical data from the bears that we go look at every fall. We actually get physical with them and measure them. Um, and that with the ice data has shown us that there's a lot of things changing in this population right now. So over the last 30 years, there's been some um, big shifts in what's going on. One of the things we know for sure from data is that uh, sea ice is changing in its patterns. So what's happening is that in the fall when these bears are waiting for the sea ice, the sea ice is actually forming up later than it used to in the past. So the bears have to wait longer on land before they can go hunt. And at the same time, the sea ice is melting earlier, so the bears are having to come on land before they used to. So what this means is that there's less hunting time and more time on land. Now on land, there's a few things polar bears will eat. You know, they will munch on some eggs and some berries, and that's fine. Um, but they really need the seals out on the sea ice to sustain them and to build body fat. So even though the sea ice, you know, there might only be um, a few weeks different. Right now, um, it's about three weeks less on the ice that polar bears had 30 years ago. And to us, that's like, well, three weeks, that's not so big. But polar bears, um, they have to eat a certain amount of seals per week. And this adds a certain amount of body fat to them, and that makes them healthy. Even losing a few seals in their season really can impact their size and their body fat. And when they're waiting on the land all summer, um, they are getting hungrier and less healthy. If you guys can imagine not eating for a couple days, think about that's really hard, right? Polar bears go months doing that. And pregnant females go eight months without eating, which is just incredible. So they have to make sure that they're hunting enough seals. Um, so what we're hoping to do is you know, slow the melting of the sea ice, increase that on ice hunting period that polar bears need and then hopefully this population can sustain itself because right now they are smaller than they used to be. Uh, the females are having fewer cubs than they did 20 years ago and we hope that that won't continue as a trend. We hope that we can do something to help the polar bears uh, be as healthy as they can be again. Thanks, Alyssa. That was awesome. And so on the Polar Bears International site, they can see that bear tracker unit and see all the, the information about the bear tracker collars that has been collected with some activities to do too. So I suggest for you students to go to polarbearsinternational.org and look at the bear tracker uh, lessons that are there. It's really interesting to see how they've tracked them with the technology. And Karen, speaking of technology, you didn't just do the pictures of outside the tundra, you also collected some spaces in town, what you call inner spaces. Can you kind of share what that is and, and people can look at those photos as well? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Julian. Yes, absolutely. So we didn't want to start just on the outside. I mean, it's we wanted to get polar bears. We wanted to um, uh, see them in their natural habitat and see the Arctic tundra, absolutely, and see the streets of, of Churchill. 
but we also thought it would be really interesting to capture some indoor locations. So one location that we captured that we talked about a little bit earlier is the uh, Tundra Buggy Lodge. And so here on my screen, I'm sharing um, an outdoor photo of what the Tundra Buggy Lodge looks like in Street View. And this is probably where Elisa stays when she goes and studies the polar bears out there on the Hudson Bay uh, with Polar Bears International. And so you can imagine her, and, and maybe someday if you guys become polar bear scientists, you can imagine yourself out here studying, sleep, sleeping in these, in, in these um, little buildings on the tundra. <laughs> um, also, people travel to this location. There are a lot of visitors. Um, and so we're going to hop inside and look to see what does it look like if you were to come and travel out here? What would it look like? I just think this is just so interesting. This is what the inside bunks, bunk beds look like inside the Tundra Buggy Lodge. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. They, they, you can uh, see that you can click and zoom around and see, wow, this is where people stay when they're out in the middle of the freezing tundra. It's just amazing. And we can go forward and we can go even into the dining hall. This is where people are are enjoying themselves and staying warm, um, taking photos of polar bears and that they might see outside. And look, if I, I can even go inside the dining hall and see where they make food and where they make coffee and where they eat their dinners. And so it's really quite amazing how people live out here in the middle of the tundra. It is possible um, for um, some parts of the year. Now I'm going to go even um, back into the town of Churchill and show you guys what it looks like if you were a fourth or fifth grader in the town of Churchill where you might be spending some of your time. This is called the Town Center Complex and this is an amazing building in this town of Churchill that has everything from school, library, it has playground, it has just a swimming pool, it has all the different things that you might want to do and you don't have to go outside and maybe encounter a polar bear between buildings. You can just hang out here and get all of the activities in for maybe your Saturday daytime. So I'm going to just click over here and go down and look at the playground. So all of this is in Street View so that you can go and look and see how kids might spend their time. Look, they even have a little climbing wall. They have some slides, some playgrounds. And so Hopefully this gives you an idea of how even the indoor spaces can help you figure out or help you imagine how people live in the tundra with polar bears in Churchill. Thanks, Karen, especially because it gets so cold up there in the, in the subarctic. When we're there in October and November, it's kind of cold like going skiing or something might mm -hmm. be in the snow skiing. But yep. later in the season, it is frigid. Mm -hmm. um, so they have to have indoor places to go to, to do things. And there's schools right there with all of it inside where they can access everything, which is really great. Yeah. And one of the great reasons that this is important to the polar bears and to Polar Bears International is that we're collecting geospatial data and imagery to show what the polar bears on the tundra, what the sea ice all looks like today. Because as things change over time with climate change, we'll have a baseline record then of what it was like and is it better in 10 years, has it gotten worse, and we can make those kind of comparisons by collecting that visual imagery. And in addition, it's all about finding a place, a sense of place. You know, knowing where you live and what it's like to live in where you are, where you are in your city. That's your sense of place. But understanding other places around the world, whether it's the Amazon rainforest or the Sahara Desert or the subarctic tundra, understanding what it's like to live in that ecosystem, what that e ecosystem or place is like, is really important for students and for global understanding too. So there's lots of reasons that we were so excited that Google came and helped us. Uh, collect all this imagery and all this data up on the tundra. I think you're right, Julian. I mean, Street View does allow you to go to a place that you may not um, know much about. And it allows you to walk down the streets. In this case, it lets you walk around Churchill. It lets you explore it, see what it might be if you live there, what it might be like if you live there. Um, and so I think that it's, it's really fun. I'm not a polar bear scientist, but I like to go into Street View and pretend that I am a polar bear scientist looking for the polar bears, looking for that small little beige dot, and then walking over to it and seeing it more closer up. So, um, so hopefully um, you guys in, your, in the classrooms there and all over the world, you guys can do the same. 
And Alyssa, how does this benefit scientists or how do scientists best learn about ecosystems and animals in different parts of the world? So uh, for scientists, the best way to get the best information is to actually go to the place and be hands-on and get the data that way. So uh, scientists go to Churchill every fall where we look at the males and the females and we see you know, how the body size is doing and then in the spring we go out and we look at mothers with the new cubs that are emerging from their den and see how they're doing. Um, but you know, it's really not financially or physically possible to be there all the time. It's also very expensive. Um, so this technology with both the bear tracker and the collars and the Google Street View is so special and important. It really fills in all the gaps of our knowledge. Uh, we wouldn't be able to see half the things or know half the things we do now without this technology. And it's very exciting for scientists. Uh, to be moving forward with things and opening up new questions that we never could have asked before. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about how you guys can help the polar bears because I know even if you don't live anywhere near a polar bear, um, you really can help help them. So the main problem right now with polar bears is the melting sea ice. And the sea ice melts when there's too much pollution in the atmosphere because it's trapping so much heat uh, that the ice is just melting more. So anything you can do to reduce pollution in the atmosphere it really does help polar bears, even if it just seems like something so little. So a few things that are really easy that you guys can do every day. Um, you know, turn off the lights when you're not in the room. Why not? It takes half a second to just flip that light off. If you're not using the television or your video games, just turn them off until you come back in the room. Uh, that really does add up over time. Another big thing is if you can drive less. Uh, so I know right now your parents are driving you around and that's, you know, that's totally fine, but if you ever are able to, why not take a walk or um, ride your bike a little more? You know, it's good exercise, it's nice to be outside, and you're not polluting the atmosphere that way, which is great. Uh, little things too, when you go to the grocery store with your parents, why not try to remember to bring recyclable bags instead of getting plastic bags? That really helps. Um, also, if you're looking for new clothes, uh, you know, I actually host clothing swaps with my friends, so it feels like we get something new, but we're just trading clothes, or you can try consignment stores, they have some really cool things, you don't always have to buy new stuff. And I think a big thing is, uh, you know, you guys are young right now, but, but things add up so much over time. I wish I had started this stuff when I was your age, really, it would have made such a difference. And as you get older, um, I think it helps to be mindful of what your politicians and companies are doing around you. And I know that sounds a little bit boring, but really if you pay attention to, okay, who's actually fighting for the environment? Who do I want to support? Uh, what companies do I want to give my hard-earned money to? Do I want to give it to a company that you know, doesn't care about polluting everything, or should I give it to a company that really has great policies and cares about the environment? Because a healthy environment really is our future. Uh, we need the environment to be healthy for humans to be healthy, as well as polar bears. So there's so many things you guys can do, and I'm, I get so happy when I see young people being passionate about helping the environment. I just think it's fantastic, and it makes me feel better about the situation of polar bears right now. Thanks, Alyssa. That was great information, and I agree with you. It's it's um, everybody can make a difference. You may think the problems with climate change and and what's happening to the polar bears that aren't living where you are. They're so far away. They don't seem related or relevant. And the problems may seem so big that I'm just one person and how can I make a difference? But collectively, we really can. And it's not just for the polar bears, it's for everyone on our planet. We all have a responsibility to take care of our planet and so it, it's up to us to do that. Uh, we have some great questions from our two classes that participated with us on the Tundra and broadcast this this last fall or this winter and that's the Grandview High School classes and we're going to start with uh, the fifth grade class and I have some questions I think my first one is going to come from Hannah Hannah um, you want to know uh, I think if you want to read your question or do you want me to read you remember what your question is about Street View I've got paper that says no. how has Google Street View and images made an impact on polar bears awareness So Karen, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I can start it, and then I think maybe um, one of you guys can add um, add a little more too. So that's a great question. I think um, 
the, the number one thing is education. That's why you guys are in school, right? Is to, to learn stuff and, and to become more informed. And, um, and so I think all of our job is to learn more and learn about the issues. Um, I learned a lot just from what Elisa just said then. Uh, working on this project, I learned a lot about polar bears. I learned a lot about polar bear conservation and sea ice conservation. And so I think Street View can help with this conservation by just educating people and making them more aware of the polar bears and how they depend on sea ice. If you don't know, if you can't see, if you can't explore and visualize what the problems are, it's really hard to understand them. And so Street View can help us understand it better. And I agree. I think one of one of the people I've worked with over the years is Dr. Jane Goodall, and, and what she's always said is knowledge leads to compassion or understanding, and then it makes you want to take action or do something about it. So this is helping us become aware and, and gain understanding and compassion for the problem, and then want to take action. And that's what the Street View and all the images help us with. All right, Yuman, did you want to, this one's probably going to be really good for Alyssa to answer. Yuman, do you want to ask your question? How has melting sea ice affected affect the polar bears? Do they have to travel more distance to get food? That is an excellent question, and that does seem to be what's happening. Um, because the sea ice patterns have changed, so when polar bears are little cubs, their mom teaches them uh, where they should go hunt at what time of the year. But when the sea ice patterns are changing so much because they're melting, the polar bears are having to walk longer distances uh, to find out where their food is. And one of the big things is polar bears are having to swim more. And polar bears are really good swimmers, but it actually takes a lot of energy for polar bears to swim from place to place. And it's not how they would prefer um, to get around, really. So that's uh, they're losing energy doing that, and it's harder for them to find, find food. So absolutely, the melting sea ice is affecting um, how many seals they're finding, how well they're eating, and we are seeing an impact on the body size of polar bears, uh, which we're worried about. But we are going to keep studying them um, to make sure that it doesn't get too bad. Yeah, and that's important because healthy bears are the ones that'll have the babies. If a baby, if a bear is not healthy, they won't have the ability to have cubs as readily. So, Muhammad, do you have a question for us? I have to say, these are the best classes. They are being so attentive. Good job, everybody. Do you think it is possible for polar bears to adapt to changing climates? Ooh, that's an excellent question. I can answer that. Mm -hmm. um, so we hear sometimes from certain people that, you know, if all the sea ice melts, that'll be fine because polar bears will be able to adapt in time. Um, but as scientists, we think that that is actually not the case. Um, for animals to adapt to a changing climate, it actually can take hundreds if not thousands of years and in the past the environment changed a lot more slowly but since humans have shown up we are changing the environment within decades and animals just can't really keep up we know that polar bears can eat some stuff on land and some people say oh well they'll just eat all land stuff um, well that's not true polar bears need the fat that comes from seals they need a lot of calories and there's just not enough calories on land to support populations of polar bears, and that's been shown scientifically. Um, it's yeah. Another thing is people. I've heard people say, "Oh, well, polar bears. They, you know, they descended from grizzly bears. They'll just turn back into grizzly bears." But that's that's really not how that works. Um, so we are seeing polar bears breed with grizzly bears a little bit, um, but that's not necessarily the best thing, and that's not. Uh, good for the polar bear population itself. So we don't believe that polar bears can adapt to land and we would like them to be able to stay on their sea ice habitat, um, which is what they are adapted for. Great questions. And we have three more for this class and then we'll switch to our other questions. So we're going to quickly finish this class and move on. And Maya, I think you're next. <laughs> Um, no. Has 
global warming affected the fish that polar bears eat? Like the seals and the fish and things? Yeah. Mainly the question. seals, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of our issues right now that we have with Arctic science is it's actually really tough for us to study seals. So to be honest, we don't have great information on how the seal population is doing. Uh, we are There are scientists that are starting to look more into this. Um, it's not as easy to radio collar a seal and follow them around. So we, we do think it will affect seals because seals need to have their babies on sea ice um, in their layers. And there have been instances now, because it's getting more wet outside, that the layers are collapsing and some more seal families are dying. So right now, well, we're not 100% sure, but we think it could be a problem. And scientists are starting to look more into the seal and the fish populations there. Good answer. All right, Jenna, you have a quick question for us? Oh. How do polar bears adjust to bright um, sunlight? That's a good question too. Polar bears have um, special eyes that help them with the glare off of the snow so that they can hunt. They mostly hunt by smell um, and their, so their vision is quite as important. Bears aren't known for having great eyesight um, but they do have dark eyes that, that can adjust to the sunlight but their nose is the main way they get around. Okay, and then is it Zina? I'm not sure I'm saying his name right. And this kind of relates to one you had before, but Zina, you can ask and then she can um, share her answer. And then we're going to go over to the grade four class. Can a polar bear survive in the forest even if it is cold? Could it survive in the forest? Mm -hmm. uh, polar bears actually couldn't survive in the forest. Uh, there's nothing that has enough body fat on it like a seal does for polar bear. And polar bears get, um, even if it was cold, they would probably still have a harder time looking for food in the forest, especially squeezing between all those trees. So I don't think they do very well in that environment. So those were great questions from grade five. Thank you so much and thank you um, for having them ready to go. That was awesome and great answers from Alyssa and Karen. Karen, before we switch to the grade um, four class, I wanted to ask you one question because this is in our, our questions on our live chat here. One of the people wants to know, it's, uh, let me see, Katie Snow's class, I believe. How long did it take to build the Google Cam? And you might just tell them what's really in that trucker in that Google Cam. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's a great question. Um, it took it took several years to build it because it was actually based on the camera that's on the Street View cars. And so um, basically, Google built the Street View car first with the camera on top, and then a trike, a bicycle that you bicycle that you cycle, and then a snowmobile, and then now a backpack. So it's kind of gone through um, multiple versions to where it is today. And basically what's inside of that camera are 15 separate cameras and, and a GPS unit. And while the person walks or the tundra buggy travels, it captures fi 15 images all at the same time that's then stitched together. Well, that's great because we had a question asking if they ever put it on a bike, so you've answered that. And the yeah. other question related to that is, how did you keep it dry on the boat so the water didn't get on it? Well, they're water resistant, so if it does get water on it, you just have to make sure you clean the lenses before you keep going. <laughs> and the, the way it looks, and there's a picture if you click on it in the classrooms of it up on a boat, when they had to lay it down, it sort of looked like E.T. taking a nap or something, or some kind of robot yeah. person taking a nap. It's really funny. You get kind of this human um, relationship to it because it looks like a head with a body. It's, real it's true. We, we, I remember, Julian, we were talking about it. We were giving it names, and it was one of the members of the team. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, all right, how about grade four? Do you have some questions you'd like to ask? Just introduce yourself and ask your question. Okay. Can you hear us now? We can. Okay. Uh, Rashawn, why don't you uh, My name's Rashawn. How fast is the polar bear population decreasing? That's a very good question. So 
right now, uh, we only our best data is in this population, and we know that it decreased 22 percent um, from the 1980s to the early 2000s. So that's that's pretty fast. Um, right now, we have a couple new survey results, and we think maybe it's a little bit more stable now. We're we're not too sure, um, but. Whenever females are impacted and have a harder time having babies, that's when the population really starts declining faster, and we have been seeing that in the last 10 years. So um, it's it's pretty quick. It won't you know it won't all happen in the next few years. Uh, we have a little while to step in and make some positive changes, um, but it when things get bad, it, it does go a little bit quickly there. So all right, do we have another question? Yeah. Just say your name. I'm Alyssa, and about how many polar bears are left in the world? Good question. So we think that there's about 20,000 to 25,000 polar bears left. Uh, we currently actually have a scientist that's reassessing that number because it was an estimate given about 10 years ago. Uh, we don't really know what's going on with a few populations because it's so hard to get to the Arctic. Uh, we also don't know a lot about what's going on with the Russian polar bears because uh, Russia doesn't tell us a ton of stuff about that, but our, our best guess is uh, around 20,000-ish, and we'll be updating that soon, hopefully. Okay. Another one? My name is Zachary. What other reasons other than global warming affect polar bears? Sure. So uh, we do know that um, there's toxins in the environment that get taken up to the Arctic that are affecting polar bears. Because of the way uh, the water and wind cycles work, toxins aren't actually affecting the western Hudson Bay polar bears as much as the higher up polar bears like in Norway. So we know that Norwegian polar bears, uh, they have a decreased immune system because of all the toxins that we're putting into the water. So that's not related to the warming, but that still relates to pollution. Um, and, you know, there, there are places where polar bears are hunted, so that does impact them. However, uh, the hunting quotas are based on science, and they're pretty strictly controlled so as to not impact the population as a whole negatively. Very good. Okay, how about two more, Jason? Okay, that's perfect. I'm Sahara. What happens if your buggy breaks down? <laughs> When their body breaks down? <laughs> the buggy. I think the buggy, yeah. Uh, oh, buggy. Buggy. buggy breaks down. Well, maybe I can, and, and Alyssa, you can help me with this one, too. Well, we actually have some great mechanics out there uh, who can come help us. If we get down on the tundra, because we're in those buggies, we're up pretty high, so we're safe. And if we get down on the tundra, we have to have people around to kind of guard and protect us as we're working on them. That's not me working on them, but the, some of the mechanics can come out and work on them. And worst comes to worst, I'll tow it back in somehow with another buggy. So luckily we have great um, mechanics out there that work with the buggy system, and we haven't had to do that very often, but it has happened a couple of times. Alyssa, do you have any experiences you want to share? Yeah, I mean, I was on it once uh, when it broke down, and exactly like you said, Julian, uh, we radioed a mechanic, and, you know, it took them a little while to get to us, but we just hung tight, and they came out and fixed it up while people guarded the buggy to make sure no bears got too curious, and there's some really great mechanics out there, so it was all good in the end. <laughs> all right, another question? Okay. Say your name. My name is Marcus. Is it harder for polar bears to find food because of global warming? Excellent question. Um, we think it might be. Um, we, we know that they have less time to find the same amount of food, which gets pretty tough, and they have to walk really long distances to find food. And actually that's one of the reasons that we want to start studying seals a bit better and find out more about if seals are changing where they're going, because if the seals are having to adjust, because the sea ice is changing, then we know the polar bears will be playing catch up to try to find those seals. Uh, so yes, we think it is affecting how polar bears are finding their food. Very good. Great questions, fifth grade. Uh, we have one here from our live chat uh, that asks how many polar bears are in the Churchill re region or in that area and also in that western Hudson Bay population. Are there more males or more females or what kind of balance do you see? So in um, the population, our last best marker capture estimate was approximately 935 polar bears. 
Um, and we do see, I believe, there's more uh, females than males. Males uh, can have a bit of a tougher time, you know, fighting other males on the sea ice and things like that. Um, so we, we think that that's the split there. Um, females are obviously very important to the population because they have the cubs. So as long as we're seeing healthy females, things things are good. But yeah, there there are fewer males, I believe. They they've got a lot of competition out there for for ladies. So sometimes they get pretty banged up. <laughs> So Mr. Hunter's Home Rune is on here on our Connected Classroom site and they have a question that Karen I think you'll be good at answering okay. and that is what other off-road areas are you taking Street View in? Um, they've seen a flying goose somewhere or a flying geese somewhere and how did you do that? Oh, you know, I don't know about the flying goose, but I would love, maybe they can put a, a link to it if, if they know where it is on, online, and I can look at it um, later in the live chat, but um, but I do know there's been a lot of places where we've taken the Street View Trekker off-road. Um, obviously, we've taken it to a lot of tra park trails um, in national parks um, in the U.S. and Canada um, and other places. Um, it's, it, we're collecting um, it in places where, of course, even there aren't even trails. Uh, last a couple of months ago, we took it down the the Grand Canyon, down the Colorado River, where we mounted it on a raft and took it down the river. Um, we also took it out to the down to the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, off the coast of Ecuador, where we actually, like like I showed you before, mounted it on a on a boat and took the shoreline, and we took we walked in, into um, the blue-footed boobies and all these others, amazing bird habitat. So we've taken it to a lot of amazing places, a lot of trails, um, and if you have any suggestions of places that you might want to see, enter, enter them in the live chat and I can see what I can do. <laughs> yeah, well they want to shrink one of them and put it on a polar bear itself. I think we need a GoPro or something. Oh my that. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then they want to know is the Street View Live, another class wants to know is the Street View Live at all times in Churchill. So do you want to ex kind of explain that just so they understand that? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> the Street View is only um, the, showing the photographs that we took when we were out there. So um, it's not live all the time, 24-7. It's just um, reflects October 2013 uh, images when we were there. Um, but that brings up a good point in that, um, you know, Google Maps and, and myself, we're going to be working with Polar Bears International over the long term. And one thing that they're starting to think about is when should we bring the Street View Tracker back? Should we bring it back in one year, five years, maybe 10 years? How can we understand how the sea ice and how the subarctic tundra is changing, how Churchill is changing, and how the polar bears are changing? And so what we're hoping is that this year was just the baseline for future collects so that we can compare and understand how it's changing. And I think we're about ready to wrap it up here, but there are just a couple things I wanted to mention. One of the chat window questions is um, that they watch the webcams on explore.org, and that's awesome because we do have live cams out there. Uh, and they're not live all the time because there's no one there to really monitor them all the time, but um, they're working on the cams, and, the, and so usually you can see uh, that but the polar bears as well as other animals on explore.org and that's an, an amazing partnership. Alyssa, do you want to say anything about the explore.org website or the camera feeds? Sure, yeah, I, I think that is just a fantastic website. Uh, in the fall, it's amazing. You can tune in anytime and people who are sleeping or sparring or just you know, walking around, sniffing things, it's so cool. Um, right now, if you were to go to it, you know, you're probably not seeing much. All the polar bears are way out in the middle of bay hunting. Uh, but hopefully the bears will be back in June, July, and maybe the cameras will be rolling then, and we can see them return from the sea ice. Yeah, and another interesting tidbit is that Churchill's also famous for the beluga whales, which come through in the summer. So that's an exciting adventure, too. And I think probably our last one here is from... Uh, Leslie McCusker's cl classroom at Franklin TWP School. I'm not sure what TWP is, but they've had several questions that we'll try to answer later. But I love this question to kind of end on. What is the most fun part of your job? So Alyssa and Karen, Alyssa first. What is the most fun part of your job? And then we'll kind of close it out. Well, I think the most fun part for me has definitely been when I get to do the hands-on stuff, uh, doing hands-on research with mothers and their newborn little cubs. Uh, it's probably one of the best experiences of my life. It's just so rewarding to be able to help them and see them up close and, um, yeah, try to make a difference for them. So it's been really great. 
And how about you, Karen? Well, um, I love maps, and I love all different types of maps. And so my favorite part of my job is when I get to make maps like this with Polar Bears International, making maps of polar bears. It's, it's really fun. So actually working on this project was probably the most favorite part of my job ever. <laughs> well, and I love the way that I get to meet amazing people like all of you. So that's yeah. exciting. Get to touch classrooms around the world and meet scientists yeah. and Google people, and it's just an amazing way and to make make you feel like you are making a difference. And each of one of you is truly making a difference when you take action to conserve energy. So our goal at Polar Bears International is to keep the polar bears in the Arctic always. It's important to remember that there's still time for saving the polar bears and their sea ice habitat and we can all do our parts to make this happen. So thank you for the things you're already doing like eating less meat, riding your bicycles, unplugging your electronics, adjusting your thermostat, all those things to save energy. Everyday actions can help reduce our carbon footprints and that will help our polar bears. But you may be wondering what else can I do? So a great way to start this is to take part in the challenges in the Polar Bears International Save Our Sea Ice campaign. That's called the SOS campaign. You can find information for that on their website. And the next effort or the next challenge we have is called Power Down and that's to celebrate Earth Hour on March 29th and that's really neat if you look on the web and search for Earth Hour you'll find out that cities all around the world will turn back their lights and turn them completely almost off on Earth Day and celebrate or on the Earth Hour day not Earth Day and celebrate conserving energy to save our planet. There's some great videos where you can see huge cities like Sydney, Australia going dark uh, for Earth Hour and it's a good thing to do at your home. So really doing that, the Power Down for Earth Day and you can learn more about that on the Save Our Sea Ice community page, the web page on Polar Bear International's website and find out things that you can do where um, you can see what kinds of actions you can take in your school, in your home and in your community. Also, check out the commit list. You can commit to find ways to do different things to do your part. So take a look at what you're already doing and pledge to do more. And finally, how many of you kids out there like to take photos with your cameras and things? Raise your hands if you like to take photos. How many of you know what Instagram is and Facebook and all? Oh, look at them yelling now. They know that. All those different things that probably you aren't old enough to use yet, but your parents know. And so your parents and your teachers can help you. And you can take photos of those great things that um, you're doing in your school and in your homes and share them. Share them through your school website, share them in your projects, share them on the Polar Bears International Facebook page with your parents or your teacher. And finally, you can visit the Tender Connections page on the Polar Bears International website and take our post-broadcast survey. We would love for everyone to take that post-broadcast survey. You'll be entered into a drawing to win a free polar bear adoption. So the survey link is going to be shared with you on the screen and you can also ha type in the chat if you wanted and we'll send it to you via the chat. So in closing, first of all, Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us today. You want to say your goodbyes and then I'll do our ending. So Alyssa, you want to say yours first? Sure, yeah. I just want to thank you guys so much for being interested in polar bears and for doing your part to help save them. It makes our job as scientists that much easier when people you know are supportive of what we're doing and it was so great to be here today and you guys had amazing questions so thank you so much for that and Karen yeah thanks guys for your questions they were wonderful and for all of your attention and bear hugs to our partners today that's Google Maps and Google Plus connected classrooms we love the Google education tools that they're given to us and that's a great way to learn and to share and collaborate and also our heartfelt thanks to our platinum sponsors Frontier our sponsor Frontiers North Tundra Buggies Adventure that's where we get those buggies and our research buggy one is Frontiers North Tundra Buggy Adventure and support has also been shown by Pearls of the Planet, a project of explore.org, a direct charitable activity of the Annenberg Foundation, and also we want to thank Parks Canada. So thank you everybody. We want to give a big thank you to everybody who watched today. A big cheer for our classrooms. Yay! All of you for taking action to help save our polar bears and the Arctic habitat. Thank you for joining us and bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.